Good evening and welcome back to our study of demonology. Tonight we will look at part six of our study, answering the question, how does Satan operate in this world? As I said last week in part five, when it comes to the power of Satan in this world, people tend to go to one of the other extremes of either overestimating Satan's power or underestimating Satan's power. Biblically speaking, at this present time, and by present time I mean between the first and second comings of Christ, Satan is currently bound. And that means that since the first coming of Christ until shortly before his second coming, the power of Satan in this world has been greatly limited. With Christ's first coming, the long-awaited messianic king had arrived. And with the king comes his kingdom. In Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 15, Jesus' first words, or I should say the first words of Jesus' sermon, are recorded for us. And the scriptures read, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. The time is fulfilled, Jesus said, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. The point is this. Wherever the king is, his kingdom is. And when God's kingdom is present, Satan's false kingdom cannot stand. Throughout the Gospels, we see Christ's authority over the kingdom of Satan by his power to cast out demons from their human hosts. Typically, with just a word from Christ, a word of divine authority, the demons must flee. But while the demons fled at the word of Christ among those who were possessed by them, the religious leaders of Israel, on the other hand, challenged Christ's authority by accusing Jesus of casting out demons by the power of demons. In other words, they were accusing Christ of being demonically possessed, casting out demons by the prince of demons, Beelzebul, and Jesus responded to their accusation in Mark chapter 3, uh, verses 24 through 26. He says, If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. But his kingdom is coming to an end. In other words, by Satan casting out Satan... That would bring an end to his own kingdom, and so why would Satan ever do that? And the answer is he wouldn't. Jesus was not casting out demons by the power of Satan. Jesus was casting out demons because he is the Son of God. And then in verse 27, Jesus says this. This is crucial. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then he may indeed plunder his house. So in this little parable... Jesus is saying that Satan is the strong man. He's the strong man of his kingdom. But Christ is the stronger man who comes and binds the strong man. And then once he has been bound, the stronger man is able to plunder his kingdom. So what then, according to these verses, is the evidence of Satan's binding that coincides with the appearing of Christ? First of all, it is Christ's authority to cast out demons. But we also see... The, that Satan is bound during this present time, the time between the first and second comings of Christ, in the report that Jesus' disciples bring back to him in Luke chapter seven, or excuse me, Luke chapter ten, verses seventeen through twenty, having come back and are giving their report to Jesus, the seventy-two return, that is the disciples with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. When Jesus said in verse 18, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, 
he wasn't referring to Satan's original fall, but to the fall of his kingdom under the power and authority of Christ and his kingdom. A power that Christ gave his disciples to tread on serpents. And that takes us back to Genesis 3.15 with the first gospel message in the curse upon Satan in which God says to Satan that the seed of the woman Christ will bruise your head the crushing of the serpent head is the defeat and here uh, Christ mentions that in verse 18 he saw Satan fall like a lightning uh, in terms of his defeat uh, by the power of Christ in Luke 11:20, Jesus says but if by the finger of God, I cast out demons. Then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So the, the stronger man has bound the strong man and has plundered his kingdom. The picture we see then in the New Testament of Satan is not of an enemy who has unlimited power, but rather an enemy who is on the run. And the reason that the enemy is on the run is because he has been defeated by Christ on the cross and his resurrection. Satan's kingdom has been overpowered and conquered. We also see the binding of Satan by Christ's victory over him in the temptation of the wilderness in Matthew 4.11. On the eve of his crucifixion in John 12.31, Jesus said, Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. Hebrews 2.14 and 15. Through death, Christ, that is, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil and deliver all those who, through fear of death, were subject to lifelong, lifelong slavery. Once again, Jesus is the stronger man who has come and bound the strong man. And Christ has plundered Satan's kingdom by delivering sinners from the domain of darkness and transferring them into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. That's Colossians 1, 13 and 14. Well... These verses and many more clearly picture the binding of Satan, not as a future reality, but a present reality. One that coincided with the first coming of Christ and will continue through his second coming. But as I said last week, um, there are those in the church, brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, who understand the binding of Satan as being that future occurrence. They see that Satan will be bound at the second coming of Christ, not during the first and second comings, but at the second coming, so that Christ can establish a literal millennial reign, that is a 1,000 year reign on the earth. This particular interpretation of Christ's coming and millennial reign is called premillennialism, which means before the millennium before the thousand years. The word millennium comes from two Latin words, mille, which is a thousand, and anus, which is year. In terms of biblical theology, uh, where does this millennial interpretation of Christ's coming and his reign come from? In particular, it comes from Revelation chapter 20, verse 6, which says this, Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. The question we want to ask is, um, before the thousand years, in verse 6, um, let me begin again, I'm trying to think of how I want to say this. But the thousand years in verse 6, this actually coincides with a previously mentioned thousand years in Revelation verses 1 through 3, and that pertains to the binding of Satan. So let's look at Revelation 20, 1 through 3, now that we're thoroughly confused. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. There's the first mention of the thousand years. And threw him into the pit, and shut it, and sealed it over him, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer, until the thousand years were ended. After that he must be released for a little while. Now according to the premillennial interpretation of these verses, the binding of Satan occurs 
after the second coming of Christ so that the period, a literal period of a thousand years, will serve as the reign of Christ on this earth. And during this period, Satan will be bound. The world will be free from demonic activity. Christ will literally, literally rule on the earth. It'll be for a thousand years heaven on the earth. But the premillennial interpretation of these verses is, is not the only interpretation. According to a view called amillennial, A-M-I-L-L-E-N-N-I-A-L, -L -E -N -N according to the amillennial interpretation, these verses in Revelation are not describing a future binding of Satan, but are rather describing the present binding of Satan, which actually occurred at the first coming of Christ, and again, will continue um, shortly um, until shortly before the second coming of Christ. Let me explain the term amillennial. It means literally no millennium, but that's not quite right because amillennialism does see Christ reigning for a thousand years in heaven, as opposed to the earth, during the binding of Satan. Now, we're not going to have time to unpack all of that because um, this study has more to do with uh, Satan's activity, not... Um, a particular interpretation of the book of Revelation, but as it uh, speaks to what we're looking at tonight, I want to follow those things. So let's look at the Amil interpretation of uh, Revelation chapter 20, verses 1, 2, and 3. All right. So both Amil and Premil folks agree that what is being described in Revelation 21 through 3 is the binding of Satan. And the reason that Satan is bound is so that he cannot deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years has ended. And then Satan will be released for a little while to deceive the nations once again. But his war against God will be short-lived, for Revelation 20, 7-15 tells us that God will send down fire from heaven and consume him and his enemies and cast them all into hell forever. All right. Secondly, This second point concerns how should we interpret these verses or this book of Revelation. And Revelation is an example of apocalyptic literature. Apocalyptic literature was popular at the time of the Apostle John who wrote the book of Revelation. And as you know, apocalyptic literature is highly symbolic. It's filled with signs and numbers and, and all sorts of strange creatures. The hard part for modern interpreters of this book is understanding the literal meaning behind the symbols or signs that are given. I would say that the original audience didn't have any trouble interpreting this. It's the modern audience who struggles with interpreting the many signs and uh, symbols that are given here. So when it comes to these verses, one of the things that we've got to keep in mind is that we are dealing with very highly, uh, very highly symbolic language. So let's look at verse 1 of Revelation 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. All right, again, what is being described here is the literal uh, binding of Satan. Remember that both Satan and angels, and this is important as we study this, both Satan and angels are spiritual beings who live in a spiritual realm. And as spiritual beings, we've studied this already, they, the Bible says they do not have bodies like men, but they can appear in bodily form. This is called, if you remember, an angelophany. But it's a temporary manifestation. So angels and demons are spiritual beings. They don't have bodies. Notice in our text that the angel holds in his hand two items, the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. Now we're going to look at the key and the chain, but let's first answer what is the bottomless pit. In Luke chapter 8, verse 31, it's called the abyss. And the word abyss is a, a transliterated Greek word that means deep hole or pit. And in the Bible, this deep hole or pit, this abyss, is the abode or better prison of Satan and the demonic host. We read in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, that God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until judgment. Now the hell that Peter mentions in 2 Peter 2.4 is not the final hell of the last judgment, but the place where demons are kept until then, a place where they come and go to and fro throughout the earth. And I might add that as God gives them leave to do that. You can read Job chapter 1, 6 through 12 for a picture of that. 
So next, let's look at Luke 8, 31, where the word abyss actually occurs. If you'll recall, this is the text where Jesus has cast out a legion of demons from a man, and the demons beg Jesus not to send them back to the abyss, but rather to cast them into a herd of pigs who are uh, grazing or whatever pigs do on hillsides over there. And, of course, Jesus says, uh, depart from him and be cast into the swine, and the swine go crazy and drown themselves into the sea. We read in Jude 6, the angels who did not stay within their own positions of authority but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. The bottomless pit or abyss then is the abode or prison where God has cast Satan and his fallen angels until the time of the last judgment. The abyss is not a literal pit somewhere in the earth, but is one of a various uh, various metaphors that represent the spiritual sphere or realm where the devil and the demons operate. And as I have already said, it is from this abyss that Satan and his demons come and go throughout the earth to tempt mankind. Let me draw your attention to Revelation chapter 9, verses 1, 2, and 3, and verse 11. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke, like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. And then from the smoke came locusts. This is a biblical metaphor for demons. From the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions on the earth. Verse 11 says, They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he is called Apollyon. Now if you remember from an earlier study, both of these terms, names, mean destroyer. So the pit is where the demons have been cast by God. It is where they are bound. It is where they come and go at God's leave to tempt and harm mankind. So let's look at the key. The key to the bottomless pit. It is a symbolic repre re representation of Christ's authority over the demonic realm. It's not a literal key. Angels don't have literal hands. Uh, the angel has a metaphoric hand, literally speaking, and in this hand he has a key which is symbolic of something greater than a key. Again, Christ's authority over the demonic realm. In Revelation 1, 17 through 18, when the apostle John beholds the Lord, he, he writes this down, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and Hades. Now, why does Christ have the key to death and Hades? Christ has the key to death and Hades because Christ conquered death and Hades by his resurrection from the dead. And so the authority to lock and unlock the pit belongs to Christ, who has the authority. He's the one who has the key by virtue of his resurrection. He is the one in charge. And the angel who holds the key in his hand, who comes to the pit, the bottomless pit, comes in the authority of Christ to bind Satan and to lock the bottomless pit. Let's see, verse 2, Revelation 20, verse 2. And he, that is the angel with the key, he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Remember, this angel has the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. It is with this chain that he binds Satan in the pit. Again, this is all symbolic language. It's not literal. It is metaphor. And he sees the great dragon the ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. All right, so the idea behind the uh, great chain and the key communicates the idea that Satan is bound and that he's not going to be able to release himself. In fact, the only... Uh, 
way that Satan gets out of the pit is when God lets him out of the pit, and even then, God has him on that great chain. Now, of the many symbols that are used in Revelation, as we think about the different things that we've learned, the chain, the key, uh, Satan is not a literal dragon. It is a metaphor uh, for uh, this terrible beast. We see all of these pictures and symbols, but one of the most common occurring symbols in the book of Revelation has to do with numbers. For example, in Revelation 1 through 3, we have the seven letters to the seven churches. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 4, there are 24 thrones, and seated on those 24 thrones are 24 elders. There in Revelation 5, 7 are seven eyes mentioned, which are the seven spirits of God that go out into all the earth. Revelation 6, 1, there are seven seals. In Revelation 8, 6, seven trumpets. And in Revelation 16, 1, seven bowls full of God's wrath. In Revelation 7, 4, there are 144,000 who are sealed by God. And of course, in Revelation 13, 8, we have the mark of the beast, 666. Six, six. And then in our text for tonight, Revelation 20, verse 2, we come to the number 1,000, which describes the number of years that Satan is bound in the abyss. Now, the point of, of disagreement between Christians is whether or not this number is literal or symbolic or figurative, if you will. Now, nearly everything that we've looked at in Revelation 20, 1 through 3, has been highly symbolic. Satan, again, is not a literal dragon. He's not a literal serpent. He is a fallen spiritual being called a demon. Now, the key and the great chain, again, are metaphorical. They are symbolic of Christ's power and authority over Satan. Satan is not bound by a literal chain, but he's bound rather by the authority of Christ. That chain represents that authority. The bottomless pit is not a pit you can find on the earth somewhere with a very deep shaft, but it symbolizes the realm in which God has imprisoned Satan and his demons. And then we come to this number 1,000, and suddenly it becomes a literal 1,000 years. Now, to be honest, this number can be taken literally. But it makes much more sense, considering the highly symbolic nature of the book of Revelation, to consider that this number is speaking figuratively, denoting a long period of time. A long period of time as opposed to a literal thousand years. First of all, consider the contrast made between the thousand years in Revelation 20, verse 2, and a little while mentioned in Revelation 20, verse 3. It seems that what is being contrasted here is a long period of time. A little while, Satan will be released just for a little while, short time, to deceive the nations again, and then comes the judgment. But before that, he is bound for a thousand years, a long time. Now, a thousand years is mentioned in Revelation 20, verses 2 through 7. It's mentioned six times. And it's mentioned nowhere else in the New Testament regarding end-time teaching. In fact, in all of his teachings on the end times, Jesus never mentions a literal thousand-year millennial reign on the earth. Neither does the Apostle Paul or Peter or any other New Testament author. In 2 Peter 3, where the Apostle discusses the Lord's return, he writes that in the last days scoffers will come, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. Then in verses 8 through 10, we read this. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. So in this end time discourse, Peter uses the words a thousand years, but clearly he is using it metaphorically as a warning to those who see in the Lord's delay a reason for complacency. Peter is saying, don't be fooled with the Lord. One day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. He'll come. He'll come like a thief. Another example comes from Psalm 50 verse 10 when it says that the Lord owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Now, does this mean that the Lord only owns the, a thousand, the Lord only owns the cattle on a thousand hills? 
a literal 1,000 hills somewhere on the earth? No, it's a metaphor for saying that God owns all the creation. In fact, Psalm 50, verse 10, that I just quoted, let me quote it in length. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. So if we take the binding of Satan for a thousand years symbolically or metaphorically, meaning a long period of time, the next question we want to ask is what time period are we talking about? If this 1,000 year reign is symbolic for a long period of time, what is the long period of time? The long period of time is between the first and second comings of Christ. And this takes us to the reason for the binding of Satan in Revelation 20 verse 3. So that he might not deceive the nations any longer. Because, and this is crucial. And this is why I think this amillennial interpretation makes better sense than a premillennial interpretation of Revelation 20, 1 through 3. Because Satan is bound between the two advents of Christ, during the two advents of Christ, Satan can no longer stop the spread of the gospel throughout the world. Now, before the coming of Christ, there was only one people that belonged to God. It was the children of Abraham, whom he called and chose, or chose and called. The rest of the world was deceived by Satan and under his rule, so to speak. But then, in the fullness of time, God sent his Son to die for the sins of the world for both Jew and Gentile, as John 3, 16 and 17 remind us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now verse 17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. One commentator writes, We conclude that here in Revelation 20, 1 through 3, the binding of Satan and the fact that he is hurled into the abyss to remain there for a thousand years indicates that throughout this present gospel age, which brings, uh, which begins with Christ's first coming and extends nearly to the second coming, the devil's influence on earth is curtailed so that he is unable to prevent the extension of the church among the nations by means of an active missionary program. During this entire period, he is prevented from causing the nations, the world in general, to destroy the church as a mighty missionary institution. And so that's so important to, to, when we see that Satan is bound for this long period of time during the church age or between the first and second comings of Christ, enabling the church to go and to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, which in fact is the great commission that Christ gave the church in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Listen to these words. And he came, that is Christ, and said to them, his disciples, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always even unto the end of the age. So Christ has, by his first coming, his atoning death on the cross, his resurrection, Christ has bound the strong man, Satan. And now, Satan can no longer prevent the gospel from spreading throughout the earth, which, by the way, has happened. From the very beginning of the early church, after the ascension of Christ, we see in the book of Acts, Satan opposing the spread of the gospel, but being unable to stop it. He can hurt those and afflict those and throw roadblocks in the way, but he cannot ultimately keep the gospel from spreading. So from the early church to this very moment, because Satan is bound and Christ's authority over Satan rules this universe, the gospel has been able to go out into all the nations. All authority, Jesus said, belongs to him. And he sends his church out in that authority to make disciples of the nations. So during this long period of time, this millennial period of time between the two advents of Christ, Satan is bound and can no longer stop the spread of the gospel throughout the world. This, however, does not mean that Satan has no more power in this world. It means that he can no longer deceive the nations. So as we've seen in our study, 
uh, Satan was utterly and totally defeated by Christ's atoning death and resurrection. The, set, the head of the serpent has been crushed. But even though Satan is a mortally wounded enemy whose time is short, he is still very dangerous. And 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 through 11, we find this warning. And we're almost done. Be sober-minded and watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Satan is bound. He can no longer deceive the nations. He can no longer prevent the spread of the gospel, but he is still a dangerous enemy. Mortally wounded, yes, but very dangerous. On a chain, yes, he can only do what God allows him to do, but yet he remains a very dangerous adversary. So in conclusion then, answering the question for tonight's study, how does Satan operate in the world? We must answer that Satan's operation in this world is limited because he is bound in the abyss during this gospel age, and that means that Satan can no longer spread, stop the spread of the gospel throughout the world, and certainly the history of the church bears testimony to this truth. Because Satan is bound, the church victoriously fulfills the great commission of making disciples of the nation. Although he is bound, he can no longer stop, although he is bound and can no longer stop the spread of the gospel, as I've said, he's still a powerful enemy of the church. And so next week, as we conclude our study on demonology, hopefully, uh, we'll conclude it next Sunday, if not one more after that, we're going to answer the question, how do we defend ourselves against satanic attack? All right, I feel like I rattle off a bunch of information there. I hope it wasn't confusing at all, but if uh, you have any questions, get a hold of me somehow, and I'll try to confuse you even more. As always, thank you for uh, tuning into this when you can at your convenience, and I pray that the study is helpful, has been helpful for you, or will be helpful to you. So until next week, uh, may God bless you, and take care, and let us pray. Father, thank you so much for your word that tells us the truth. Thank you that Satan is bound and can no longer spread, stop the spread of the gospel. Help us as your children, Lord, to live in the light of that truth, and let us be mindful of Satan's tactics, but let us be bold in the assurance that we have that Christ is the victor. In Jesus' name, amen. Good night. See everybody later.